Okay, so there we'll there we'll go. Roy, um I uh, yeah, first of all, it's a pleasure to meet you finally. You too. The infamous too. Uh, uh don't forget the modelers. Um I wanted to ask you how you became a clay modeler. Um a long time ago I became a clay modeler. Um I I got asked if I would um be interested in kitting out a studio more like a builder than, than a clay modeler it was more um creating display boards painting the walls making the tea for the blokes it was just um everything but the clay but i was surrounded by a good bunch of blokes that had been in the industry for like the past 20 30 years they were they were very experienced guys and uh, it's horrible to say it but um half of them are dead now it's uh <laughs> It's just one of them things. I was the youngest kid. I was 18. I don't know. I was about 20 when I joined. It was 1995. I joined a company called Porter Whiting, which was a consultancy in Essex. And um, they were not far away from um, Ford Design Studio in, in Basildon at Dunton. So years and years ago, Dunton would have the whole run of the mill with the cars and the truck and the transits and the, every vehicle really was being done in Basel and as alongside Cologne. So um, there was a lot of outsourcing going on on Ford's behalf years ago, 20 plus years ago. So there was a few consultancies around in Essex. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough to, to get to this um, consultancy working for a guy called Peter Gammons um, and we, we were just busy. It was a three-year apprenticeship. I stuck with it. I was convinced, you know, it was the way to go. I'd never done anything like it. I never, knew, I never really knew it that uh, this job kind of existed until then. You just assume that um, cars are made on a computer, right? You just go with the flow. But there was these blokes that were making these tremendous models, telling me how good the contract in life was. I didn't have children at the time. I was with my my wife. Um, I've been with, with my wife for. 30 years which makes me feel old but we were 17 when we met and um it just went from there you know i i, I did a three-year apprenticeship sam and off i went contracting i went off to cologne i carried on the ford um line of work and met a great bunch of guys as i went along but roy how did you how did you get that first gig as a as an apprenticeship how did that how did that come about uh i was a i was at school, I was quite a maker and quite a drawer. I was never really a thinker. So I was quite a creative person at school. I'm a bit like my father. And um, the long and the short of it is I was a delivery driver for a parts company. And I had a van, so I was everybody's best friend. And um, one, one time I was asked by my uncle if, I could, if he could use my van. So I'd, I'd been to college. I was doing a, a degree, uh, um, a, a, a construction course at a college. And I was making these lovely forms and making stuff for my, my flat, which uh, I was living in. And um, he was working at Ford's, my uncle. Didn't really know what he did. He was always abroad. And um, he saw some of these. He needed my van one day and saw, came around and saw some of these forms that I'd made and asked where I'd got them from. And I said I'd made them at college. And... Um, it kind of went from there. He then asked the questions back at base, and um, I, I got into I got in the automotive industry as a a bit of a bit of a bit of a hands-on worker, I suppose. So it's through my uncle that he gave me the chance to go to this um, consultancy in Basildon, and um, honestly, Sam, it wasn't easy. I, I was doing all the all the proper like shit stuff from the beginning it was all the stuff that no one else wanted to do it was the painting and it was the making and it had nothing to do with clay whatsoever i was really determined to get onto that clay model uh, i was really determined to get into clay and um it went from there it went from there i say i had really good guys around me that had been in the industry for a long time and um they convinced me to go to go that way and then the 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 inter the apprenticeship was through this consultancy, not Ford. No, it was through the consultancy for three years. You know what? I was two. I was about one and a half years into the apprenticeship, and it's funny how 
agencies get your details because I was asked, you know, there's a job in Spain, there's a job in France, and they were dangling these great big carrots for me to go. I was on a pittance at where I was, and they were trebling my salary if I could go next week. So I said to my uncle, I've been offered a job in France. Um, it's three times what I'm earning now. It's like, you won't be able to hold yourself, Roy. You're, you're shit, <laughs> basically, <laughs> what you do. You know what I mean? It's like, stick with it. You've got to stay here. You've got to learn. You've got to learn. So I, 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 he wrote me a letter and everything, and I, I was so grateful for it. I stuck with it. I didn't, I didn't chase the money. Um, I stayed with the apprenticeship. Um, I've done my three years, and then I, then I went away. But it, ironically, I stayed with the consultancy as an agent. And um, I did a further year and a half out in, um, in Cologne at Ford. So I was working for Ford at the consultancy. Uh, three years later, I carried on the project. So I did the facelift of that program um, in Merkinish. So um, it worked out all right. It worked out, it worked out quite nice. Where, where all of you, what countries have you worked in? Mainly Europe. I've never been, never been further than Europe. It's been France and Sweden and Germany. That's it. Not been anywhere else. And the Midlands. That's, uh... <laughs> that mi that might little... as well be abroad, yeah. It's just as far for me. I'm in the southeast of England. It takes me two hours to get to the Midlands. It takes me uh, an hour and a half to get to France. It's, it's, um, it's quicker for me to get to France than it is to get to Coventry. Jesus. Mm. So when you when you were working in the Midlands, were you driving up every day or what? No, I've, I've kind of got this system where if it's two hours, if it's more than two hours, I'm staying away. When I was working out in Germany, I was 20 minutes drive to Stansted and, um, you know, an hour, an hour's flight from Stansted to um frankfurt and and then another half an hour to work um i was able to sort of come home for kids birthdays i was able to pop back for stuff so i'd fly out monday morning pop back wednesday for a birthday go back out thursday morning ryanair flights were like a quid it was it was a piece of cake and it was um became a bit of a routine as the kids came along it's harder to um go away for longer because um it's quite tricky on that you know, you got an early flight Monday morning off to Sweden, say, and um, you got to kiss your kids on the head while they're still asleep and say, like, see you Friday. It's really quite tough when that when that happens. But if it keeps the thought ticking over and keeps everyone happy, it just becomes a bit of a routine. At first, with no children, it's easy. Your wife or your girlfriend could come out with you and um, you have a great time. When you've got children... It's, a, it's a, a totally different ball game. Unless you up sticks and you all go out somewhere, then, uh, you know, you're finding it's with your two, aren't you, right? It's tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we we trying to base our existence around around where we are now. I mean... You do, the, you do. The, the, yeah. You can, you can go and chase another contract and move everybody over there. But then, of course, yeah. that comes to an end in three months. And at sure. some point, I mean, they, they need... Everyone needs some level of uh, stability. Absolutely. I mean, we had, um, years ago, we had a, a handful of consultancies around here where you could hop between the lot all the time for years. And then when Ford gave up all their, um, they only concentrate really on transit now at Dunton, which is near me. Um, the, the car range went back to Cologne. The work consultancies kind of closed down. So um, it got a bit, bit harder to um, hop around, as it were, you know. Um, is are you still? Are you, do you ever do you ever uh, work at Ford anymore or not? I've not been at Ford for about five years. The last thing we've done at, at Ford was a, a, a very large program. It was a it was a truck. It was a, um, like a cargo, like a container puller, which they haven't got in their range, and they haven't had in their range for the, I believe it was like twenty years or something like that. So you've got these tremendous scanners and volvo trucks and ford had this vintage thing knocking about and they decided to um go for it so that was the last time um i went to that place and i don't believe they've had any contractors in in since it's just been in-house it's mainly cars it's basically it is cars now at dunson it's just cars. okay well um but no but i thought i thought they were doing predominantly as you said commercial vehicles not anymore 
Oh, but beg your pardon, it's transits. It's transits. Oh, okay. it's a variant okay. of transits. There's probably four, four or five variants of transit that they do at Dunton. Um, I'm sure they're, you know, they're merging with other people for electric, electric uh, vans and stuff. But um, nothing has really um, boosted um, modelling just yet. It might happen, Sam. I kind of doubt it. Cologne seems to have um, really amplified its studio and um, concentrating on grabbing it all. I'm sure for years and years, people have said, you know, it's all going to go to Cologne. It's all going to go to Cologne. There's always been a bit of work at Dunton, but it's never, it's n it's never really been consistent. It's a bit confusing because they they're like five minutes ago they were all they were in a bit of hot water and now it seems like they're ramping things up again. Yeah, uh, you know that they, they are merging with other companies. They are going to be doing electric. Uh, you know they're going to phase out diesel. Everyone's going to be doing. Everyone's going to be getting choppy. Um, in the next five years, it's going to go. It's going to go crazy for electric, isn't it? That's the next thing that's going to hit everybody. Electric. So um, they're going to phase out the diesel. They're probably going to phase out the petrol. Um, it's going to be more um, concentrated on um, ecologically friendly vehicles. Roy, what, can you tell me about that first experience out, out in Cologne? Um, yeah, it was quite nerve-wracking for me because I've never been, I've never been out before. So um, I, you could say I'd, I'd mingled with the wrong crowd, but um, I met some really great people. We did some tremendous work and, and we were respected for the jobs that we'd done and we turned out nice products um that's the main thing it was um it was good it was it was it was weird because i never spoke a word of german but within the year i was picking up the basics and having a, having the odd conversation with a few locals they speak tremendous english so that made it a lot easier it was um a good contract it was good I, it wasn't as bad as i thought it would be it, the fact that i'd gone with um probably a, a dozen brits we had a good time you know we were going out we were having a few beers a few scoops in the evening and um we were we were making the most of it sam it was a uh, it was good was there any like uh, big old geezers that took you under their wing there were some big old alcoholic geezers that took me under their wing <laughs> and uh, i put on about three stone in the first year i was there and it was just it was Hefeweizens that were, every time I'd come home, I was putting another half a stone on. It was, it was bonkers, mate. It was, uh, it was good fun. It was good fun. I think it stretched my liver a little bit, but I had a good time and we knocked out nice, nice stuff. And uh, it went back there, it went back there a few years later to continue, you know, a facelift version of what we'd done previous. It's, it's weird because you go somewhere, you do something. If it becomes a good model for them, then generally you, you build a good rapport with that designer. That designer, when the facelift time comes along, wants the team back that he had originally and uh, you get the call. So you're generally hopping to and fro contracts, um, updating what you did previous. No, no different to what you're doing, I should imagine. Paul, was there, was there any, uh, like any country that you liked working in the most? It's not really the country, Sam. It's the people you meet. It doesn't really matter where you are. If, if you can build, uh, you get a couple of mates on board, um, you have a good time. It, it, it's as simple as that. You, I can't really say A studio is better than B studio or A country is better than B country. It's, um, it's never really like that. It's never really like that. It's, um, it's the people that are on your team. You know, it's quite a clicky little community, the clay side of stuff. And you generally bump into people that you know of um, or you've heard a lot about. And um, you go from there. You start going down the pub. You end up, end, end up uh, putting on a few pounds at the end of the contract. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know what but, I mean. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean, especially if you're with a bunch of English guys. If you're with a bunch of English guys, it's, it's weird because... If two of you go out, you know you're taking turns buying the rounds. If six or seven or eight of you go out, you know you're eight, pint, you're eight pints down before it's uh, your shout again, and <laughs> it's rude not to. So you end up uh, you end up having a great time. You do end up having a great night. Great. <laughs> that make me feel really bad. Anyway, I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. No, that's that's awesome. Listen, so um. 
what what I Roy, I wanted to know like um the whole apprenticeship thing doesn't really happen anymore. Do no, you no. do you do you think that that sort of thing might come back again? Um, I'd like to think so because um, as a clay modelling um, community, I'm pretty certain that the the, the numbers are, are diminishing. It's a uh, I still I'm forty I'm forty uh, forty six, but I still feel like I'm one of the youngest blokes doing it. In my mind, I'm still working with people that I worked with when I came when I went on my first contract. You know, I've built a great friendship. I've built a great rapport with with everyone of course there's the uh, there's the few young ones that come in and again you you um you, you take them under your wing if it were you, you you start to learn who's um who's good who's not who's good at uh, backing in volumes really quick who's good at finishing for for the for the team you know it's um it's good you don't see a lot of young ones i think when i was at gaiden um that was the first time it sort of hit me that there was a whole bunch of like newbies coming in and, and that's the first i mean that, that, that was probably uh, i'm going back a bit now probably four or five years ago again it wasn't that long ago sam but um there was a lot of young ones coming in that were going straight on the clay and it's good to see them it's, it's great to see them on there it's great to see them on there it's well, but at the, the same time you're kind of you kind of you want to get stuck into your little bit you know you want to you want to take ownership of the bit you're on so sometimes you you're, you're fortunate enough to be put up against, or you put alongside someone that you build a bit of a relationship with. You know what? And you might see him again. You might see him down the line. You might see him in a year or two's time. But I think it's important that you you do build up a good relationship with everyone you meet, regardless of skills. You know, you, you do come across people. I dare say it's the same in your game. You'll come across alias guys that, that haven't got a clue what they're doing, but they're, but they're really nice people. And you're you kind of thinking, oh, you know what? He had a bad lad. I'm going to work alongside him. I'll do him up a little bit. I'll work him along. You know, you, you build him up. You build up his skill set a little bit more. And you end up cracking out a nice um, nice model at the end of it. But, uh, Paul, you know, sorry. Uh, Paul? Uh, Roy. Roy. <laughs> so I'm just you can call me Paul if you like. <laughs> do, I look, do I look like a Paul? No, <laughs> but I heard from <laughs> Paul, <t> <laughs> are you talking about Mr. House? He told it. I apparent word on the street is that you, you, you're the quickest draw in making cocks out of clay. Uh, I don't fucking hang it out. If there's a cock to be made, <laughs> if there's a cock to be made, I can do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick my head up. And if there's a surprise cock in the oven, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. I'm not afraid to say I can do it. And they're the best ones, man. They're the best ones you've ever seen. <laughs> but that's 25 years of cock making. <laughs> I can't believe he bloody said that. I left over a word with him. He's a bastard. He's a bastard. Fucking hell. No, I've had some surprise cocks in the oven <laughs> ready for it. <laughs> ready for Paul on big on big reviews. He's had to go to the oven to get a little bit of clay just for the old uh, exec review. And I know, I know he's going there, and I know he's going to open that door. So I'll give him, I'll give him, a, I'll, I'll give him a big one on the top shelf, waiting for him to open that door. So. <laughs> oh, it's nice. He's never said that to me. What? They're it's just nice. skilled in making cards. <laughs> It's nice to be remembered for something. <laughs> I've never put a bit of dialogue on one, but oh, I, can it. <laughs> I can imagine it's pretty good. If it's coming from house, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing! But tell me, so funny boy. You've apparently, but Roy, apparently, you've got quite a, um, a legendary toolbox as well. I mean, are those tools created? Mainly for the cocks, or is that something? Is, is that a <laughs> no, hand listen, job? Listen, let's get off that. Sam. Okay, all right. The, uh, okay. the cocks are the last thing. They're the last thing. Okay. When you're confident enough, Sam, to knock out a gem of a vehicle, then you can make a cock for the oven. Okay. I don't think you'd be doing it the other way around. <laughs> you're jeopardizing your position at work. Yeah, you might it's not get. Good. Yeah, no, you, you know might what I mean? get in. Yeah. Well, it's then, different, you see. There, there you go. You couldn't do one in Alias. 
I've done one in ADIS, but I think it's, it's probably not as good as as, uh, mm. as as doing one in clay. So have they ever milled one? There we no, go. This is the no. artisan. This is the artisan kicking in. You can create a cock by hand, which you couldn't mill. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone slick it up once it's milled <laughs> <laughs> for a review. You know what I mean? I can't believe we're talking about flipping tops. No, no, no. We should probably move on because may maybe some people no. get offended. We are in 2021 and yeah, people and get... For the people record, are, you started this. Yeah, sorry. My bad. I'm, you know, right. Some right. people are sensitive. So anyway, yeah. um, can you tell me a little bit about, on a serious note about your toolbox? Because it, it's it's apparently quite legendary. Yeah. You know what? You get you get bunches and bunches of stuff you want to use. And, and after a while, you just... Decide, you know, you can do without this, you can do without that. So you 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 limit yourself, especially if you've got to pay for it when you're going abroad for the weight. It costs it costs money, so uh, you don't need to take tons of tons of stuff. If you can get and do everything you possibly require, uh, you requested to do with a minimal amount of kit, with a minimal amount of kit, then um, I think that's a good thing. You know, my my tools, my tools provide my um, my family with income i don't want to take two ton of shit that looks good i'm never going to use it i don't want to take the stuff i'm good at I, I need to use to be good with um so i've limited it down over the years i've limited it down and i've got this tiny little tool kit now that, that houses everything that i need to use and um it's not a showcase it's just um I don't need, you know, there's tons of gadgets and gizmos that people are developing over the years to come up with certain ideas or to cut circles or to cut radiuses and to do chamfers and fillets. And, you know, as long as you can do what you what you need to do with them with a minimal kit, then uh, that's what I've I kind of set it, set it upon myself to get rid of. I had two toolboxes of stuff, Sam, that must have weighed like half a ton. And every time I went to France. Or every time I went to Germany, my flight was my flight was a quid, but my tools were like fucking seventy quid. <laughs> <laughs> I decided that's enough. That's enough. Let's try and get my tools down to a quid. <laughs> well, tell me something. The, the, things have things have obviously changed a lot over the years. When you started out, you were were they milling? Were they doing pre mills first, or were you? They they no, they weren't milling. We were doing great big full size body side plywood. Uh, sections with like filler squeezes and stuff like that. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No, the old folk will know what I'm talking about. Can you explain every, that every for the young for the young uh, folk? Yeah, you'd, you'd create, you do your, you go your basics, you do your scale models, themes. You'd go, to, you'd whittle, whittle it down to like one theme. You'd go to full size. That would be that would be milled. That would be fine. You know that would be milled. But then that, you would then modify the milled data um, as requested. Uh, on on a side, and then you would take sections every sort of hundred mil or every three hundred mil with like eight foot sheets of plywood. You would cut them near the form of what you created. You would do um, like a car body filler squeeze up against the clay. You would then sand all that down. It was very long winded, but you, it gave you the option to create a, a, a nice symmetrical model for a review. It's a, it's it's a a long old process you need a great big wood shop alongside the design studio so you you were making sections all day long out of plywood but it's still the same you'd still be creating you'd still be adding and taking off clay um by hand body side sections would be done by hand if they were milled then they were modified quicker you know it's, it's good having the milling machines for knocking in a volume but you know if um if you've got a, if you've got a review first thing in the morning with with the execs, um, there's no time for a scan. There's no time for a tweak, and there's, there's certainly no time for a, a remill. Obviously, as you know, you've got to go down the cutters to get quite a nice finish before we clean it up um, to present. Um, with with uh, I'm saying about the hands on, you know, it's um, there's no time to CAD. And mill it's quicker to knock it in by hand. It's quicker to rake something in. Quicker to slick it in, spline it in, and and present that way. Do you think? Do you think things have um, 
like you know designers in general have been able to go in with with a, a less clear idea because that uh, we you can just scan resurface and mill again now um milling milling's good don't get me wrong I, I love milling you can you can mill a model out and you can slick it up and you can present it but when it goes outside and they look at it uh and they decide that a feature needs to come down 20 mil at the front and 15 mil at the back. It's going to take another three days later. You're, re, you're just loading it up and remilling it, remilling it again. You can, um, you know, you find it's, it's a lot quicker just to whack a tape on, rake something in, clean it down, combed finish, not a highlighted finish, just a volume finish, and um, and, and go at it by hand. As far as um, you know. The machine can't quite put in that finesse at the end. That's always done by the modeler. It comes out the milling machine with a with a twenty thousand cusps all over it, and you have to knock that down. And then, really, you just want you you find fault. The modeler will find fault because the spline isn't going over that surface correctly. The uh, the surfaces aren't running correctly. So it's tempting for a clay modeler to go go beyond that milled data. But then you kind of get a little bit of a bollocking for touching the milled data so sometimes it's quite faceted the surfaces sometimes the intersections don't run run quite as um as sweet as you want them to be um you know and you present that yet once you present that um it's it, it's like the the only thing when you when it's in a review and you've cleaned up a, a, a milled model it's almost like everybody in the world wants to find a fault in that model. So if it's not quite running smooth, um, it gets it gets brought up by by someone in the in the review saying this isn't blending in or that isn't blending in. You know, whereas as a modeler, you you know you'd find you can find a lot of fault in a clay model um, that's not shown in a in a rendering, not shown in a digital rendering. You know, the the the, the designers are brilliant. I can't knock them. I can't do what they do. They turn out some terrific stuff. But when we get it for the first time and we have to create an image for them, it's the first thing, um, you know, you've got to create something that doesn't exist, Sam. It's, um, it's a bit of pressure on you to, to try and um, rep replicate that, that rendering. The milling machine will just go for whatever's programmed in and it will cheat corners, and you'll end up with horrible sharp edges. You'll end up with radiuses that don't OD, uh, that, 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 that don't OD into the next surface. It's just um, millions. I like milling when you you know later on down the line, not at the beginning. But for a volume, it's good at the beginning because I'd say ninety eight percent of the model would get uh, man, uh, manicured to the to the correct feeling uh that's wanted you know a bit, a bit of finesse again a little bit of uh, a bit of surface a bit of caressing you know you can feel it with your hands it's um i'm not going to knock the milling i'm not going to knock hard parts you know people used to say oh sla machines are going to take away um tons of your work it's um it has rapid prototyping has taken away a, a, a bunch a whole bunch of our work yeah. Um, you'd, you'd have a little, um, you'd get a drawing for a, a radio, a steering wheel, a door pull, a vent, a dial. You'd go to your desk, you'd have a day making it, you know. So now what seems to happen is the rapid prototyping is coming in and we're just cleaning up apertures to fit a resin part when it when it turns up. I'm all for that. I'm all for that. It's, um, it's a great time saving device. Roy, what I wanted to what, what I wanted to ask you is like what things um what things do you think have have changed changed for the better and what like what things have changed for the worse in as as far uh, as as far as clay goes for the better um I think the rapid prototyping like I say it's 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 helping us out a bundle you can you can set something up in the evening and it's, it's it's ready to take off the machine in the morning maybe more so like an interior part um which we could let into an aperture in our in our in our model um i i don't think anything's changed for the worse it's um are you guys feeling like more and more time pressure to do things in a shorter period of uh time in a shorter period of time no i don't Sam. Um, 
I don't because if someone comes up to you, Sam, and says, we need this done by tomorrow, they'll ask you if it's possible or not. So nine times out of 10, it is possible. We don't care, you know, doing the ghost of stopping on later on to get it finished for the morning's review. That's part and parcel of the, of the job. Everyone else to go home, you know, someone might order some food for you. It's um, a very rare occurrence that that happens. But um, it's, no, I'd, I'd say nothing, nothing's got worse. There's no more pressure on the mod on on the modeler for making making stuff because you've always had to you've uh, you've always had to do you've always had to present the best you can you know in, in the back of your mind someone is going to tell you it's it, it shit if you're presenting something awful it's um sometimes at the start of the project a designer will give you a sketch it's all fuzzed out around a corner you can't um you, you know, in the, in your mind, by the time you, you put that fender into that front bumper or that fender around that rear quarter, that it's not going to be like the rendering. It's um, you might have a rock hard razor blade finishing a uh, rear lamp, which um, in the in the rendering is just a big soft a blur. So you know, you get some hard parts, you build around them hard parts, you change the rendering quite a lot. But you, uh, an experienced modeler will, will just openly should say to the designer, "There's no chance it's going to look like that." Uh, you know, it, it, it's got to bite the bullet and, and say uh, that's impossible, you know, to have a go at making it resemble the best you can, uh, the rendering. But um, a lot of the time it doesn't work out, but you create something better. It, it lends itself into something else. It lends itself into another feature, perhaps. It's uh, you make it, it, it's, it's evolving all the way, all the way through, all the time. Roy, well, just to give everybody a, a, a rough idea, like, well, I mean, I know it, it varies from studio to studio, but generally speaking, on a, on a scale model, would you be like, let's say a third scale model, or would you be working on that on your own? You generally get a body side on your own. If there's a quarter scale, my <laughs> 40% or a third scale on, on, there'll be three or four models at the start of a program. You know, they'll be split centered. So there'll be six modelers. They'll, they'll whittle it down, Sam. They'll whittle it down to three models. They'll whittle it down to two. Then they'll have a, a, have a review to finalize um, where they want to go. Sometimes they'll merge models, uh, which will create huge offsets once they mill the data out. But, um, yeah, it's nice It's nice to take control of the, as much as you can because you might have done something differently to the guy on the body side. You might have done something differently to the guy on the front end or the rear end. So. Is you know you, you kind of you're kind of banging heads with someone if they're on the body side over the center of the wheels center of the wheel arches they tend to stop work and between you you come up with an agreement of how it's going to be and you know with a bit of tape three or four meters of tape later you've blended something in and it works it works and, and and then and then event so eventually once you guys move off the scales you eventually uh one theme gets uh down, gets translated onto a full scale yeah it'll be scanned and it'll go for, it'll go up to full size and proportionally it'll get blown out of proportion it's um it won't really look as sexy as it did as a scale there'll be areas that um that uh, yeah that will turn up that, that you wouldn't have never put in at the beginning. The, the you know you you try and compare it to a, a toy car. You know you got a toy car with a one mil shut gap on its door. If you was to blow that toy car up to full size, that shut gap would be about seventy mil. It's uh that's that and that's a hole. So imagine a surface. It, it, it's the same deal. You blow that you blow that up to full size. And proportionally, sometimes it looks like an inflatable car. Sometimes it looks like a, 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 a pile of shit. Sometimes it comes out really good. It comes out slightly different to what was intended in the first place. But once it comes out full size, it's very rarely left. It's very rare that people would say, fucking hell, that looks good. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, It needs a bit of tweaking generally after it comes out full size. Well, the scales are generally a, 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 a little bit slightly exaggerated in areas aren't yeah. they? Yes. yeah they are they are okay and then and then when you go from the scale up to the full sky for, for to to the one to one yeah. those six modelers will generally then all be working on the single thing. yeah it, sometimes it might be the guys that are working on the scale model that's chosen will be working on it even even when it goes to full size they they would normally split it down the center 
and do a couple of themes full size because obviously you're seeing a different you're seeing a different um, you're seeing a different beast in full size for the first time. So you get a couple of guys on each side. They might go try and normally try and get a front three quarter in so the front's balanced or a rear three quarters in so the rear's balanced. Um, but generally, the guys on the scale that got picked would be the guys on the full size. The other guys would be going on to the next program. They'd potentially be working on the interior, which is uh, started for the first time. Uh, now they've got data, you know, they can see what's what and see where uh, door skins and uh, center consoles and IPs have got to meet uh, surfaces. So, yeah, it's uh, normally you, if, you're, if you're on a scale and it gets picked, you, uh, you follow it through. And then you would have, would you generally have like one guy on the body side, one guy on the rear, one guy on the front? Yeah, yeah. Okay. the guy on the body side would stop center of both wheel arches. So then if, you, if you've just received, let's say you got like uh, the, the scales got picked and you're now translating at one to one. Generally speaking, they'll scan that, go into data, boost it up, and then the mill will happen. How long? Yeah, are, what? Yeah. Whilst that's going on, obviously for the first time, they've got a whole bunch of data that they'll give to engineering. Right. Okay. Okay. So here's again. This is this is a, a like how long is a piece of string kind of question. But mm. if you guys have just received a rough mill, right? It's come straight out the uh, out the milling machine. Yeah. And you, there aren't massive changes. Your instruction is basically just to slick up and, and yeah. dynock everything how yeah. long would that take if there aren't crazy amounts of changes with three guys roughly on a side oh blimey you could have it slicked up in a in a, in a day if, you, if you're only going to present half the model slicked up with a mirror maybe stuck on the front or a three quarters you could between the three of you you can get it done in a day easily no but It'll do you, be are, are you are you talking about a scale now or are you talking no, about a full size full size it's been, wow. it's been milled it's been milled sam so it, oh, the surfaces are already there you're just knocking the cusps off you're not really doing a lot of you're not really doing a bundle of work you're not really creating a decent highlight because it should have been generated from the data so you're okay. just taking the cusps back to the surfaces um you, you'll have it done you'll have it done in the in the, in the day three of you easily it's, it's, it's not a big deal you're not taking a lot of material away and then how it long depends how it depends how finicky they want to be. If they want to cut, start cutting shut lines in, if they want to put a, a bit of detailing in, then obviously it takes a little bit longer. But uh, normally, three good blokes could, could have it turned out in a day. That's that's normal. Is that is that just the slicking up, or is that is that dressing it with Dynock as well? Uh, no, Dynocking, Dynock, I like Dynocking. It's it's kind of a bit of a reward at the end of the day because you've done a lot of work, you've done a lot of scuffing, and now it's kind of clean work. So uh, get the Dynock tank in, and again, um, yeah. Dynocking takes time because normally it's the paint you're waiting for. You, you you're waiting for the paint to dry. You, you normally we hit these models with emulsion, black emulsion normally on intakes and vents and, and houses and stuff like, and, and, and pockets. You know the glass is obviously in black vinyl, but the vents, the nostrils, or the intakes will be just um, larruped in black emulsion. So it's, you either wait for the dynox to dry so you can start painting, or you wait for the paint to dry so you can cut a little bit of dynox in without all the paint sort of running all over the model. It, um, it doesn't take long to clean up a, a milled model. A couple of days tops. A decent team would say, we've got a review on Wednesday, you know, on Monday, out, can we crack on it? It'll be done. It'll be, it'll be done easily by Wednesday. You know what? No matter how long it takes, no matter, you know, if halfway through the day, if someone says um, there's a review tomorrow morning, it always gets done. It always gets done. The blokes will stay behind. You know, they'll eat, a, they'll eat a couple of slices of pizza and have a, have a two gallons of Coke and then it'll be a, a presentable model in the morning and then we'll all be half asleep and we'll just go home. I, I, can't, I can't think any time in my um, career that, that we've presented something that's not done. It always gets done. Yeah, it's funny how that happens, actually. There's, there's times yeah. where you get thrown something and you think, like, I'm never going to fucking finish this. And, no, and but you do. Always, you do. You all chip yeah. in. You all chip in. And that's a good thing with a team. If you've got a good bunch of blokes, you don't have blokes that drift off halfway through the evening because they've got to go to some other, some other event. Um, 
it's quite nice. It's quite a nice. It's quite a nice reward at the end of the day that you've presented something that you worked your socks off for. It's never well, our fault. It's never our fault that um, the model changed. You know, it's always a decision. It's a decision by the by the lead uh, by the designer that would say, "Is there a chance? You know, so and so's coming in in the morning. This has got to be finished. Can we do it?" And you always say, "Yeah." You always do it. It always gets done. Thank you.